I believe physics has two goals. First, uh, it explains nature, as you say. We, we try to, to um, decode some, somehow the, the world that is around us and to figure out what are the laws that govern this world, what, what happened in nature. Uh, that's very important. Uh, but also physics uh, creates new things. And now it's an avalanche. Now everywhere in the world, in every university, there, there are research groups, research labs working on quantum technologies. And these quantum technologies, they, they are spreading, still invisible. And now we are, one of the tasks we are working on is to use these superfluids of liquid light to induce superconductivity at room temperature. That would have a huge economical impact. And it takes many hours, sometimes more than one day, to grow a structure. Uh, and that's why these kind of artificial crystals, that are, they are much more expensive than any natural crystals, even diamonds. Then it becomes dangerous, because it means that you can crack any code, that nothing is safe, no one's bank account, and also Pentagon with its nuclear arms is not safe, and People uh, with good or bad will can penetrate and maybe uh, trigger some, some, some unwanted processes. So here it becomes more important and that's why quantum computer is considered as a nuclear bomb of the 21st century. Wow. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about light matter coupling. We have Dr. Alexei Kavolkin joining us on the show. Hi Alexei. Hello. Thank Hello, you so everyone. much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Great audience. Hope you will enjoy it. Alexi's background is so epic and I'm so excited for the content we're going to be sharing with you guys. He's the director of the International Center of Polar Atonics and chair professor at Westlake University, where his research is focused on the physics of liquid light. And you can find all of his links in the bio below. Okay, Alexi, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Well, what I know, professionally, I have to know things. Uh, so I know that we are going through the second quantum revolution, how it is called. The first one happened at the beginning of the 20th century and it brought us uh, internet, uh, video cameras, uh, mobile phones, uh, but also nuclear bomb and everything that surrounds us and fills our everyday life nowadays. Uh, the secondary, uh, second quantum revolution, no one noticed so far that it, it's happening, but it will have a very significant impact on our life, maybe in five, ten years. Uh, so this is where we are going. I don't know exactly what is going to happen uh, in terms of our everyday life, but more or less we, we know that robots are coming and, uh, well, uh, also things linked with security uh, may strongly change. I think this is the most sensible aspect because uh, cyber crime is something that no one cares really about, but it is going to be a major problem, I think much more important than global warming in, in, in just a few years. And uh, the second revolution brings new arms, new, new weapon, uh, and it also brings new uh, protection uh, measures, uh, a mechanism, for, well, in this, in this uh, invisible war of uh, info, info crime, and uh, you know, uh, also there is, uh, we, we never know what, what's uh, happening, uh, but between countries, between big players in this world, there is always some invisible fight uh, in this uh, information space uh, that so far is done with use of classical uh, weapons, what we call uh, classical computing. 
but as soon as quantum computers will come into play, it is like passage from uh, conventional weapons to nuclear weapons. It's more or less the same kind of kind of transition, and it will be very serious. Oof. Okay. So I like this uh, more big history perspective on this massive advancement of the first quantum revolution that occurred and what incredible fruits we got from that and how physics again is pushing into new frontiers and getting this towards the second quantum revolution, which uh, I would love for you to actually unpack a little bit more. Um, maybe we do that a little bit later, but just, and I love your focus on both the, uh, the seriousness of this because it has uh, implications on both uh, massive advancements for society, but also we must be ethically, morally, philosophically, spiritually wise as uh, as that as that happens and it's very important right so everyone uh, maybe knows that well or, or can guess that uh, people were uh, living happily even before uh, internet or, or, or cell phones uh, and actually uh, at the end of 19th century the world seemed to be perfect also from from the point of view of physicists they had a complete picture of world that was self-consistent and um, physics was considered as a dead science. No one thought that physics will be needed and that any significant development uh, will, will be coming. And then there were just little signs that something goes wrong uh, that induced uh, some people to slightly uh, adjust laws of classical physics, like Maxwell equations for classical electrodynamics, or so Planck came with his quantization of energy the quantum appeared and uh, that was the beginning of 20th century no one thought that this quantum may, may really come uh, into everyone's life but then slowly slowly with einstein who explained well there, there is this purely classical relativistic theory of einstein but he also contributed to quantum mechanics uh, linking uh, energy of light to the frequency of light and explaining that light is composed actually by particles, photons. Uh, then, then there was uh, Bohr with his model of atom, then there were other physicists, and uh, slowly, slowly it has become important. And when uh, President Harry Truman uh, discovered, actually in 1945, that the United States uh, will soon have a nuclear bomb, it was a full surprise for him. So until then, no one really was taken seriously that, but just a few months uh, later, uh, you know, uh, bombs were dropped into Hiroshima and the new, new uh, epoch uh, started. Uh, so now we are also living through this, pre uh, this uh, period when it is uh, invisible. Uh, Richard Feynman, a great American physicist in the 1950s, he was uh, the first to propose a new way of uh, computing that he called quantum computation, quantum computing, and it was just a theoretical concept. And uh, then there were some mathematicians contributing to that, some quantum algorithms were proposed, like Shor algorithm, but it was just a game of, of uh, professionals uh, in a very narrow research field. Then, at the end of the uh, 20th century, uh, first attempts to realize what is called qubits, uh, the, 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 the quantum bits, uh, that uh, are needed for quantum computation were so first attempts were um, published and now it's an avalanche now everywhere in the world in every university the, there are research groups research labs working on quantum technologies and these quantum technologies they they are spreading still invisible uh, so uh, what is what is new what 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 is that uh, that exciting about quantum technologies the idea of quantum computing initially was very nice that instead of doing operations one by one uh, you know with binary logic uh, the classical computer is is, is uh, it, 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 it basically you put in a classical computer a sequence of zeros and ones and this is a binary code and then there are operations that transform these sequences of zeros and ones to other sequences of zeros and ones and at the end you take out uh, also a sequence of zeros and ones, and this is what a classical computer does. 
the, the idea of the concept of the quantum computer is that you also start with a binary code, but then out of these millions of zeros and ones, you make basically one state that is some linear combination, something between zero and one. Uh, some uh, some mixture. If you have or uh, orange juice and uh, apple juice, and you mix them, you can have any kind of mixture. So classical uh, uh, classical computing it only recognizes purely orange juice and uh, purely apple juice. But in quantum uh, physics, we work with this all kind of mixtures, and of course the variety is enormous. And then miraculously, when when we take out the information during the readout again all these mixtures are transformed into the sequences of zeros and ones that we can convert into video into sound etc etc so the computation is accelerated by many many orders of magnitude and 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 and, and so what one can ask because of course even now there are supercomputers that are more powerful than classical computers but it turns out that the a simple quantum computer with maybe 50, now Google reported 53 qubits, it may outperform the most powerful supercomputer that would work for, for, for years. So a quantum computer in a, uh, in a few seconds would do the, the, the amount of work that, uh, that the, the supercomputer uh, would do in, in, in years. Wow. Uh, now, yeah, and what? Okay, there are fast and slow computers, of course. Uh, our mobile phones today, they are much faster and more efficient than huge computers in 1960s. But now it comes to the problem of security. Because everyone uses credit cards. Everyone uses internet accounts. Telecommunications. Telecommunications. So everything is protected somehow by classical cryptography. So usually, usually it is always the same trick. You type some password that is uh, compared, uh, uh, you can digitalize it. It's also in a number. Any password is a number. And this number is usually uh, one of the elementary uh, factors of, uh, of a huge number. So you have a huge number, you need to factorize it. And any classical computer spends very long time on that. And the quantum computer using this short algorithm would do it in, in a second. And then, then it becomes dangerous because it means that you can crack any code, that nothing is safe, no one's bank account, and also Pentagon with its nuclear arms is not safe and people uh, with good or bad will can penetrate and maybe uh, trigger some, some, some unwanted processes. So here it becomes more important and that's why quantum computer is considered as a nuclear bomb of the 21st century. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's go in with the quantum computing considered the nuclear bomb of the 21st century. Interesting. Yeah, because you are not supposed to kill anyone with quantum computer, but you can uh, penetrate uh, any defense system uh, and you can then uh, maybe send nuclear missiles and destroy the world. Wow. Okay, so I have so many questions. Let's, let's start with... Um, you are obviously well versed in the history of physics. Do you feel like physics is doing the unlocking of the source code that was initially launched with the Big Bang? I believe physics has two goals. First, uh, it explains nature, as you say. We, we try to, to um, decode some, somehow the, the world that is around us and to figure out what are the laws that govern this world, what, what happened in nature. Uh, that's very important. Uh, but also physics uh, creates new things. So uh, the, uh, initially I, I started my research as a theoretical physicist and I quickly realized that it is important that you are able to explain some experimental results. But it is even more important if you are able to predict something. Uh, and now, now the quantum com computer is uh, this uh, pure product of human brain. So these great, uh, great uh, founders of uh, quantum theories like Richard Feynman, 
they invented it. Uh, it did not exist in nature. There is no quantum computers. So it is, it is a human creature. Physics is both understanding the laws that govern our reality nature, and it's also the creation of this first quantum mechanics revolution, which gave us the computer, which is... Can we also say that this, in a sense, is a creation of nature because it came through us, which is a creation of nature? Oh, philosophically, yes, definitely, yes. Uh, creation of God, if you want, that's through us. Uh, but um, so even the quantum computer is then also a creation. Yeah, of everything. I, all, all human creations are, after all, uh, nature creations are God's creations. Uh, but uh, still, uh, as a, as a physicist, I know that there are two completely different sorts of tasks. One, you observe something and you try to ex to understand it, and this is very important. But it is more conservative, or the more aggressive task. You, you want to invent something new, test it, try it, and make use of it. Okay, so I, I like the distinction. So we have a, a, a process of observing something and then, and, then cal and then just running hypothesis, running calculations, understanding it better over time. And then there's literally creating a reality. Yes. And, okay, and so the, the, the first quantum revolution and the second are more on the creating? Uh, I would say it started from uh, interpretation of um, observations, results of uh, observations. So uh, mm. atomic theory, for example, there were data uh, well, uh, of, of many experiments that provided uh, some information on the structure of atoms. So, so people had to come up with a model of atom. So, so everyone knew that uh, the universe is composed by atoms from ancient Greek time, but no one uh, knew how, what is inside the atom. And uh, then different models were tested, Lord Kelvin, Bohr, etc., uh, Rutherford, and eventually quantum mechanics uh, was uh, able to provide the better model that explained all this ensemble of experimental data. Then this same quantum mechanics was used to propose, like Einstein did, uh, lasing, for example, amplification of light by stimulated emission of radiation. This is already a creative work of quantum mechanics. And of course, nuclear bomb is also something that did not exist. Well, it existed in sort because uh, nuclear synthesis and uh, this kind of processes, they happen in stars. But on, 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 on Earth, it was, it was purely invented and realized artificially. How do you... I, I love the analogy with the orange juice and the apple juice. So normal computing is either apple juice or orange juice, and the quantum computing can be any combination yes. at, at every single bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 the miracle is when out of all these uh, mixed states, you obtain again orange and apple juice. Out of, on the output. Uh, yeah, this is this is projection of a quantum state. So you see, initially you put in a classical state one zero one zero 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 one, uh, etc. This sequence of, of numbers. Then quantum uh, computer starts mixing them, and you have some strange mixture. Uh, but then out of this strange mixture again you extract your zero zero one uh, code. And this, this last result is really a miracle of quantum mechanics because this is called quantum measurement that projects a state to some classical basis. The famous example is uh, Schrodinger's cat. And the quantum state is a cat that is neither dead nor alive. We do not know. It is a superposition state between dead and alive. But when we open the cage and we check, we find either dead cat or, or, or alive cat. And, and this, is, this is what happens also in quantum computers. The, the readout converts the quantum state to, to some classical basis. And in this process of the, the miracle happening in the black box <laughs> for so many of us, that is the quantum computing, that the 
ability to move from the normal binary into all of the you all of the unique possible mixtures and the computational and the permutational capacity of it to use that process yeah 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 I exactly there are two sorts of problems one is purely mathematical because the binary logic is well developed uh, since uh, several centuries uh, but uh, this quantum logic, it, it is not yet fully built. There are some algorithms that are tested that may be efficient, but not, not as many as, as in classical logic. So mathematicians, they keep working on it and they keep in, inventing new and new operations with these mixtures. What can you do with a mixture? You can invert it, for example, uh, instead of 65% of orange and 35% of apple, you have the, the, the opposite proportion. This, this sort of things. So new and new quantum gates are proposed. And, and, and this, this is a pure theory. Then this needs to be implemented. So we physicists, we, we try to find material systems, uh, and there are many of them, where quantum algorithms may be, uh, may be realized. And current, currently, I mean, there are over 10 probably different systems, including superconductivity, superconducting qubits, uh, cold atoms, uh, individual spins of uh, whatever ions, uh, solid state physics, defects in diamond, for example, photons, that is my field, uh, and uh, many more, molecules, etc. Everything is tested as a platform for realization of quantum uh, technologies, quantum computation. It's not yet clear who will win, which material platform will be chosen, will be yeah. the most efficient. Wow, what a cool also, in a sense, race that's happening with the second quantum revolution of which style of quantum computing is going to be um, most efficient or could different forms be used for different applications uh, effectively. That's. I, I have another question. The question is about do you feel like the amount of potential, uh, like you warned us earlier, that the potential malevolences that could be unleashed with the co quantum computational power, do you feel like it's a, the, our best way to um, hedge against that problem is to work on ourselves like morally spiritually ethically philosophically so we can learn how to uh, use the technology on the good side of it or do you feel like this going really hard on the security um, side of it is or do you feel it's a combination of both how do you feel i i feel that so far the protection systems are it's it's not about human psychology it's about physics again and the systems are being developed. This is what is called quantum cryptography. Uh, so instead of classical codes that will be easily cracked, um, now many countries uh, develop systems that use so-called quantum key distribution. And China, by the way, is the most advanced now uh, in this area. They have the world's first quantum satellite now flying around uh, the globe. Uh, and this is what the does the quantum satellite do? Quantum satellite is a device where you generate pairs of uh, so-called entangled photons, photons that they uh, that are uh, like twins. They know each other. They remember each other, even if they are very far. So the satellite sends two photons. One goes, for example, to Beijing, and another one goes to Moscow uh, or Washington, and. Uh, uh, this provides uh, so these these photons they encode um, they they carry the code for for communication. So you send your encrypted message through the uh, classical channel uh, by internet, email, whatever. But uh, it is encrypted using the code that you receive from satellite. And uh, you, if you send the message, you have the same code as a guy. Uh, whatever in Washington who receives the message because it comes from the same satellite and it is encoded with these twin twinned pairs of photons. And if someone intercepts one of two photons, the other one will be immediately uh, will feel it immediately. So you will just take it out, and you you will you will be able to only choose safe safe pairs of photons that no one uh, intercepted. 
uh, this is this this makes it very secure this kind of communications and uh, and it exists already there is no yet uh, the worldwide quantum internet but i hope it will be built uh, maybe in five six years Whew. you said that um, human psychology doesn't really play that big of a of a deal you you, we just have to build the, the 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 quantum encryption systems that are going to protect, um, like the the quantum satellite that's going to protect that's going to entangle photons to protect communication. We have to we have to build all of the security measures uh, because is it that we don't feel like we can trust human psychology to? Uh, uh, right. Uh, so it's a question of funding. Uh, human psychology. So decision. Uh, making mechanism uh, depends of course on human psychology and politicians who give money to this or that uh, branch of research they are human beings uh, so far I think uh, the approach generally in May uh, the approach of main players like the US China uh, Europe Russia it is very conservative so money is is given for uh, defense systems uh, in, and probably much more than for for this um, dangerous systems, but we don't know. Uh, I know one can 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 tell you for sure that there is no any private uh, research uh, group who would really dig into realizing uh, these dangerous applications of quantum technologies. Alexey, do you also consider it to be? possible and what would you say would be the proper trajectory if so with human psychology developing uh, deeper morality and ethics and philosophy and spirituality to the extent at which we make it super disincentivized period to ever behave in a malevolent way to try and intercept the communications or behave poorly with the quantum technologies that way we can maybe not need to go so insanely hard on the security side of it well uh, realistically i don't think that the the whole population of this planet will uh, become so so good and <laughs> that i always you have someone who who is tempted to do something bad to to others and i think this is in human nature and it's difficult to eradicate it entirely so i think this is the reality uh, that will uh, that, and we, we have to take it into account. So we should build our protective measures. It's not, I don't believe that any government uh, nowadays uh, is really willing to destroy the world. This I don't believe. But there are certainly dangerous individuals who may have or this or that uh, goal that is potentially dangerous for everyone. Mm, it's a and also both happening at the same time is great uh, conscious evolution for humanity away from malevolence while we also do some of the security advanced the security measures of quantum cryptography alexi um i want to know more about your journey it's really interesting hearing about your father also being a physicist also your son one of your children your son yes. is a physicist as well seems to be like a lineage of physicists. Will you tell us about you growing up and how you got interested in physics? All right, I was born in the Soviet Union and effectively my father um, was a professor at, and he, he did some experimental research in hydroacoustics. So uh, it was something familiar to me from, from the childhood. My elder brother, who is seven, seven, seven years older than me, he has chosen physics. So it was quite natural for me to follow um, their steps. Uh, on the other hand, I always um, wanted to do also other things uh, like uh, literature, drawings, music, uh, chess. Um, so physics is not the only thing uh, in the world, but it, it is interesting, it is challenging. Uh, fortunately, in the Soviet Union, uh, there were very good schools. Um, so I uh, uh, was fortunate to, 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 to be graduate from, graduated from one of these schools specialized in physics and mathematics. And uh, many actually, well, two Fields Medal, recent Fields Medal uh, winners, uh, this is the highest distinction in math, uh, are from the same school, Perelman and 
uh, Smirnov. So that, that's a really good education. Uh, so then the Soviet Union collapsed mm, and with all this education we had nothing to do because economically it was a, a disaster. Uh, you know, the, 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 the researchers at, at, um, in the Academy of Science, they were paid on a level of maybe $20 per month. Uh, so, so everyone, uh, either, either you have to be wealthy, and, uh, but not so many people in the Soviet Union were wealthy, uh, or you, you had to, to look for another job, that is a pity, or you had to go abroad. And I went abroad, like many thousands of Russian scientists, so I worked in France, I worked in Italy, I worked in UK. Um, and then um, now, you know, the world of physics is very international. Uh, it is not that important where you work because always you are in contact with people all over the globe. And that's very exciting. This is one family. and We do not have any, for example, political tensions in the, in the world of research, absolutely nothing. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, this is how I come to China. China is, is really exciting now. Um, it invests so much in fundamental science. It, 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 it offers a really fantastic environment. And this is a country of great civilization. Um, yeah, also, they had the, the difficult times in 20th century, but they managed to educate many good students uh, abroad. And now these students are coming back already as uh, grown-up researchers and they take uh, leading positions in the universities in China. So the level uh, really of science in China is growing very rapidly. Uh, in contrast with what we see in Europe, uh, whatever, Russia and even in the US, it's, it's, it's not growing on that, that, that speed, I would say. Uh, so yeah, China now is, is, is one of the most exciting places in the world to do research. Agreed. Yeah. So this is a very a part of the story of the, um, the rise and, and collapse of some of the uh, that's been happening over civilizations since we started. And so there was a, a collapse and you went and you continued doing your research. You were you had this drive towards the fundamental science of, of physics. And so you went and you continued doing work in Europe. And you actually spent, this is important to mention, you, you spent 13 years uh, from 2005 to 2018, right before your move to Hangzhou at Westlake, as the chair of nanoscience and photonics and professor of physics and astronomy at uh, the University of Southampton. Yes. So um, during that process, before this move to China, what were some of the big, exciting things that you were doing and teaching and working on? Uh, well, in 2007, um, the group of researchers at the University of Southampton uh, published the first paper on, now it will be a technical term, Bose-Einstein condensation of polaritons at room temperature. But I explain what it is. So it is again something with Einstein. Uh, Einstein predicted that, uh, well, there are two sorts of particles in the world, uh, fermions and bosons. Fermions do not like each other, they never stay in the same uh, state, but bosons do like each other. And at very low temperatures, bosons come to the same quantum state, that is a state with the same energy, same uh, speed, uh, uh, same momentum. Just a quick pause, this is, this is at like CERN, where you're... Where you're colliding particles mm, this is well uh, in CERN they, they definitely study elementary particles but to obtain these uh, condensates uh, you probably need a different uh, experimental environment it, it is not you do not need accelerators because uh, uh, you need to cool them down to very low temperatures in accelerators they are very very hot um, but uh, in I mean at the end of, of uh, 20th century, uh, in Cornell University and in MIT, people managed to observe these condensates of atoms, atoms uh, maybe bosons as well, uh, but at temperatures of uh, tens of nano Kelvin, so it is one billionth uh, part or ten bi uh, 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 one one over one hundred million of a Kelvin, or, uh, and one Kelvin, now, now we are sitting at a temperature of 300 Kelvin. That's so the temperature. So that's the temperature. Okay. And, okay, it was a great discovery, they got Nobel Prizes, but 
completely useless because no one would work at that temperatures. It, only in laboratories you can achieve so low temperatures. So then in 2007 we have shown that the same phenomenon with different kind of objects can be realized at room temperature. And I think it is very, very exciting when you bring the physics that was known to be very, very exotic, that only existed in a very specific laboratory conditions, when you bring it to everyday life, to ambient temperature, this opens huge, fantastic field of applications. And from 2007 till now, in these 12 years, um, probably several hundred researchers came into this field and uh, again, in all major universities in the US, in Europe, in, in Asia, people study this, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, and this is all about liquid light, so polaritonics. My center here is the center of polaritonics. So polariton is this, this particle that we managed to condense, so to put many thousands of them into one single quantum state, when, uh, where, where this huge amount of particles behave like one. So imagine you have cars on a motorway and you uh, traffic jam because all cars move with different speed and some of them are very slow and then others come and then jam uh, is forming. Now imagine if you, all of them move with the same speed, mm -hmm. exactly the same, 10,000 cars or 1 million cars, never traffic jam. Mm -hmm. This is superfluidity, this is what is called superfluidity. Mm -hmm. And this is what we observe at room temperature with this polarity, that's incredible. So I think this was my, uh, I, I, I was not the only one uh, working on that, but I was a theorist of the group. And uh, this is uh, one of my most interesting research works, I would say. And um, all, all subsequent works were actually the development of this one. Superfluidity of which particle? Polaritons. Polaritons. Yes. Okay, and polaritons are? Quanta of liquid light, uh, so uh, light, uh, you know, light, uh, we, we, all, we all see light, right? It's something that comes from sun, uh, but light is, uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be described as a flow of particles that are photons, the quanta of light. So the sun all the time is shining photons in yeah. all directions, even these lights are yeah. shining photons. Yes, yes, yes. everyone, yes. Okay. And, and you, do you see the world that way? Do you see? Yeah, this is a quantum mechanical picture of world. Yes, light, light is, a, um, is composed by billions of billions of billions quanta that are these photons. Okay. And uh, light of different color, for example, red photons are different from blue photons. This is about uh, the property of photons. A slightly way. different wavelength. Yes, yes. And wavelength, frequency, momentum, these are all characteristics of photons. But, okay, this, these particles, these photons, they do not interact with each other. They, uh, basically, they all propagate with the same speed. Uh, and they are described by uh, laws of optics. Uh, now, what we study is what happens with light when it enters into semiconductor crystals, artificial crystals made of semiconductor materials like gallium arsenide, for example. So light entering inside does not disappear, but it mm, changes its properties strongly. So it propagates inside the crystal, uh, but it also interacts when propagating with crystal excitations, so-called excitons. And this is how polaritons are born. That's how polaritons are born. Yes, yes. So when the light enters a uh, yeah, a crystal, crystal structure. A crystal structure. Uh, then uh, it, it gets coupled. So you can see it like light, a photon is absorbed, it disappears for a, for, for a short moment, and some, uh, something changes in the crystal. So some electron gains energy and goes up in energy, for example. Uh, then this electron comes back and the energy is released again in the form of a photon and again it is reabsorbed. But from the point of view of quantum mechanics, there is no uh, uh, separate photons and separate um, excitons, uh, excited states of electron, but there is some mixture. Again, Schrodinger cat, that is neither dead nor alive. No. So it is not matter, it is not light, but some mixture, some liquid light. 
Some liquid light mixture, light matter coupling. Exactly. And this was a discovery by you and a bunch of others. Oh, uh, well, that's as, as any discovery, it has many fathers. So yes, uh, po yes. polaritons, theoretically, they were predicted in 1950s, 1960s. And then they, they were studied in, in, in different materials and structures. Uh, but our contribution was that we have shown that at some conditions, these polaritons, they all come to the single quantum state, that is this Bose-Einstein condensate. Mm, and this is very interesting because a single quantum state, what it means? It is like single, single particle, single object. Uh, this is what I told you about the cars. They all move simultaneously. They all uh, behave like, uh, all like you, you, you know, insects. If you have a lot of insects flying, and the then they, uh, yeah, then they, they, they copy movements of each other. So the same uh, happens with these photons. So you started observing liquid light that was uh, turning into a super fluidity. Super fluid of light. A, yes. a super fluid of light. And then what then did when you when you were when you guys were there, you know, seeing this happening, what were you immediately thinking about regarding why this is so important? What it can be used for? Oh, the, 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 we had several uh, several ideas of potential applications. Uh, one of the first was about superconductivity. As you know, it's it's one of uh, major challenges of uh, physics since um, the discovery of superconductivity in uh, 1911. Um, uh, everyone dreams uh, uh, of uh, finding uh, material where superconductivity would exist at room temperature. The superconductivity it means that you pass electric current and there is no losses and this potentially can save you tens of billions of dollars and also there are some fantastic applications like interstellar you know flights and these engines that would uh, would cons would be much more efficient than anything one can imagine now so this this is not yet resolved and this is one of the major challenges of physics but if the superfluidity of liquid light exists at room temperature I think it really shows that also superconductivity may exist at room temperature because two phenomena are very, very similar. And now the, one of the tasks we are working on is to use these superfluids of liquid light to induce superconductivity at room temperature. That would have a huge economical impact. One more time, you saying the last part again? Uh, this would have a huge economic impact. The, sorry, the, the superconductivity, if, if it is realized at room temperature, uh, at temperature like, like here now, then we would, uh, it would be a new industrial revolution. So the, so the, so the superfluidity of light matter coupling makes superconductivity Yes, I tell you the difference between two. A superfluid is electrically neutral. And the superconductor is, is a superfluid of charged particles. So it can carry electric charge. That's why current, uh, that current that propagates uh, without any viscosity, so without any resistance. And that's, that's, that's something that is used in accelerators for example uh, uh, huge magnets or here in china you have a train going from shanghai airport to to the city this maglev it is based on uh, superconductivity so it, it it levitates it does not touch uh, trails uh, but all this is achieved uh, at low temperatures and if you would be able to 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 do the same at room temperature it would have enormous economic impact. And now let's talk about this move. So much of this uh, physics is incredibly uh, complex to, to me and to so many others. And it's great hearing you aiming to make it so relatable, but it's just so complicated at the same time with Oh, oh man! Um, look, it's 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 yeah. No, it's, no, no. It's not really complicated. I think cooking, for example, is more complicated than physics. Uh, if you want to become a good chef, really, you need to 
to be much more talented, uh, then you would need to become, a, to become a good physicist. I don't know about that. <laughs> Pretty sure. Because there are more factors, you know, intuition plays uh, in, in, in a kitchen. I, I like cooking myself. I know how little we can rely on, on recipes, on written rules. You should have feeling. Physics is more straightforward. There are rules, you just apply them. <laughs> oh my gosh, who would have thought? Yeah, wow. Okay, L let's talk about, um, so let's, let's, see, let's see on this, uh, let's see what we can do here. So, uh, uh, the, so the discovery of uh, polar tonics was to, around 2007. Yes. And, and uh, you have the, this is the physics of liquid light light becoming liquid because it couples to matter and then that process is critical for superconductivity um, could unleash a massive paradigm this are, and these are things that are now um, happening with you in your lab at Westlake yeah, this is one of the goals not not the only one and let's talk now on this transition so okay you mentioned earlier that you found the amount of fundamental science being done in China to be really important. Yes. I do too. Tell us more about that and about what is happening here with your, you directing the International Center of Polar Atomics as well as being a chair professor here at the university, why you're here. Uh, I started a little bit more than one year ago, um, but everything here at the Westlake University is very new because the university did not exist until last year. And this is very exciting because really you have an opportunity uh, to build a center on your own design uh, from scratch, from nothing. Uh, so I was given funds to build, um, we are now building several labs and I'm hiring people there are two more professors in our center and some research scientists and students are coming. So hopefully in one year we'll be about 30, 35. So already a big lab. And um, for, for my research field, for this physics of liquid light, it is a unique opportunity to bring together the uh, growth technology. You know, we need to grow our artificial crystals where we fabricate this liquid light. Uh, it's not natural crystals. You need really, you need uh, reactors or whatever to to make them. Oh, how do you grow the artificial crystals? Atom by atom. This is called molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, basically you have three sources uh, in a vacuum chamber that send uh, different atoms like aluminium, gallium and arsenicum and uh, they send them basically one by one. You, you, you grow the structure monoatomic layer by monoatomic layer. You can control it up to the uh, position of every single atom. And this is an expensive machine, and uh, but this is something that exists uh, in many countries. Y your the machine's name one more time: molecular beam epitaxy. Molecular Be beam epitaxy. Yes. Molecular beam epitaxy. It, it you can take different atoms and then and then have them create. Yeah, you put them then and they oh, form a crystal lattice. They form a crystal lattice, yeah. but how does you can you so you can take the atoms and have them one by one form this crystal lattice yeah. and it's like it's like 3d printing in it's yeah it's kind of 3d printing yes you can print uh, different kind of uh, shapes three-dimensional uh, shapes um, pyramids for example and you just feed it whatever atoms you want it to print Oh, no, no, it's, it's not that simple because uh, for every sort of atoms you need its own source and uh, then uh, usually in, in a typical chamber you have just three or four uh, sources so you cannot grow any material you want. You need, when you buy this machine you need to choose already the, the, materials. the materials, yes. Okay, so mach the machine is made, do you know which company makes the? Oh, many, many, of many them. Many companies yeah. make them. Be, okay, and then th they tailor the, the the manufacturing of the machine based on which atoms you want to 
yes. print. Yes. 3D yes. print to create. So you're creating artificial crystals. What is the size of these crystals? What is the internal like lattice structure? Because how do you maximize the success of the light matter coupling? All right, so the crystal is grown on a um, substrate that may be of a couple of inch diameter. And uh, there you, you, you start covering uh, it by this uh, very thin monoatomic layers of uh, the structure that you are interested in. And it takes many hours, sometimes more than one day, to grow a structure. Uh, and that's why these kind of artificial crystals, that are, they are much more expensive than any natural crystals, even diamonds. Um, so then you have a structure that is very thin anyway. It is thinner than in uh, human hair, uh, but uh, you know precisely uh, w how it is organized, which layer goes after which layer. And, and this is where you, you can observe some interesting physics. A couple inch uh, plate yeah. has uh, a, a monoatomic layered uh, crystal that is uh, less than the size of a hair, which uh, is about 50 microns. Yes, uh, so, so actually the substrate itself, it is not that thin. It may be, I don't know, uh, 0 0.1 millimeter if you want. Oh, okay. So 100 oh, microns. Okay. Uh, but uh, then on the top of it, you grow a structure that is typically several micron thick. Just, just maybe three, four miles. And what is that structure at the t on the top? Uh, well, uh, structures we are using are called micro cavities. Um, these are kind of, um, you know, if 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 in in elevator, uh, sometimes they put mirrors, and you see your reflection from both mirrors. So light goes between two mirrors back and forth. And, uh, this is uh, uh, the same principle, but on a, a micro. Meter scale, oh, which is what makes it so the photon goes between the two yeah, between two mirrors, and it the light matter coupling just continues happening, happening. Yes, yeah. The photon doesn't go out. The thing is that it remains inside, and then it couples more efficiently with some crystal excitations. And the crystal excitations come from the container that it's in. The yes. fact that it's in this crist artificial crystal that you made. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, in any crystal, a crystal is made by atoms, and in atoms you have electrons. But in, in, in a crystal, what happens is many atoms are close to each other, so electrons can jump from one to another, so they, they form kind of C. Uh, so an excitation is when you take one electron from the C, and you put it on, a, on an upper uh, energy level. Uh, so uh, what remains in the C, it remains this empty place where you took it, that is called a hole. Uh, hole, it is a scientific term, and, uh, uh, and, and it can be described also as a quasi-particle with a positive charge. Uh, so this hole and this uh, electron, they, uh, they attract each other, they interact, so it, it tends to come back, but during some time it, it leaves above, on this level above, and it, uh, then it falls down. Uh, so this process, it, uh, it can be uh, repeated many, many times with emission or absorption of a photon. And this is how, how it all works. This is how the polarity appears. Now, is the, is it, well, let's get a little bit more technical here. Is the, f is the photon coupling with the electron when it connects with the, with the, la with the crystal lattice? Yeah, everything happens in a crystal. Uh, the crystal is like a forest. You have these trees that, uh, and you, you walk uh, be below the trees, then you have a squirrel. So your electron is a squirrel that jumps from one branch to another. Uh, and then, I don't know what analogy you can use. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you're shooting something, you have a ball, and you, uh, you shoot it to the squirrel, and the squirrel jumps up. Uh, but then squirrel uh, shoots the, the same ball to you and jumps down and, and uh, etc. So this is and and then then it, it jumps from one tree to another and propagates. The squirrel is the photon. Uh, squirrel, yeah, the squirrel can be uh, also the electronic excitation because electrons in, in crystal they are free to move. 
Okay, now um, it's it was interesting hearing you say that us manufacturing artificial crystals because there's none of them that are naturally evolved that we know of are more expensive than diamonds. Yes. And so every time you spend a day printing one of these, it's extremely expensive. Yes. Okay. And then um, there could you could we hypothesize that there are other uh, crystals that we could make that could also assist us with really uh, hard physics challenges. Oh uh, yes, this is this is what um, this is how the, this science develops. So people have ideas about new design of new crystals. We in our uh, theoretical unit, for example, we always propose designs. Then these designs uh, go to the growth laboratory. They look at them and they say, "No, it's rubbish. It cannot work." And we, then we come up with a new design, and finally they take one and they say, "Okay, we'll try to do something about that." And then they grow a structure, and and then our um, optical lab uh, is performing all kind of measurements, and then we see it is not what we expected. And then we go back to them and say, "No, you have grown uh, some rubbish structure. It's not what we wanted." And say, they say, "Oh, yes, we forgot this or that." This is this is how the science goes forward. And what? Do you guys get from the study of the light matter coupling? How do you take that and go to superconductivity? How do you take that and go to photonic quantum computing? How does that um, translate to that? Yeah. Right. This is exactly about designing different sorts of structures. So for superconductivity, what I need, I need to take a superconductor that already exists. Uh, and that has um, so-called critical temperature. Uh, crit uh, so superconductivity is achieved below some temperature. And above this temperature, it's a normal metal that is not interesting. Uh, so the critical temperature for superconductivity is very low. And this is, this is a problem. Our challenge is to make it higher. So we cover our photonic structure, our microcavity, with this layer of superconductor. And we try to optimize the design of the sample in such a way that the superfluid of liquid light helps superconductivity in this structure and the critical temperature goes up. If we manage to see it, we are the happy winners, but uh, it's not yet done. Uh, for quantum computing, it's a different design. We need to make these qubits, you know, the mixture of orange and uh, apple juice. We need to do it with our liquid light. Uh, so we basically we mix a light that imitates orange juice with light that imitates uh, apple juice and we need to be able to operate with that and control this liquid. Uh, this requires, uh, well, different sort of structures that we engineer and we produce. What do you hypothesize is the crystal design that your team needs to make superconductivity and photon quantum computing? Well, we usually start from intuition, and this is what makes us closer to this uh, chef uh, in, <laughs> in, in the kitchen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah. then, of course, uh, with the only intuition, you cannot go to the growth lab and, and uh, run this setup that costs many million dollars. Uh, so after uh, this first intuition, we do simulations, we do computer modeling, and uh, we usually do not uh, grow immediately the complex structure that would be the final one, but we try to do it step by step, element by element. We do tests, and only when we are completely sure that all together it will work, we assemble it and we go for the final experiment. It's like launching something into the outer space. You would not just build it and launch. You really need to be sure that all, all your equipment works as it should. So many of the leaders that we now interview on the show use simulations in some way, shape, or form, and it's fascinating now thinking about how many industries that it's entering into, people are using it in order to be more efficient. Um, yeah, and, and uh, do you feel like you can leverage the computational capacity of, of running all of the permutations of crystal structures to see what could be optimal uh, 
Uh, you know, this is interconnected uh, because quantum computers, uh, they are uh, very promising also for simulations, for creation of new materials. Uh, this is their peaceful function. They are not only dangerous uh, weapon, but they, they, are, they, they can be useful for something. And especially for superconductivity, because superconductivity needs very complex structures and classical computers, even supercomputers, fail to predict their properties. Uh, so we, uh, so far, we do not uh, rely on uh, that much on the computer power. Uh, we are doing, um, it is not an industrial research, we are doing the pioneering research and some proof of concept experiments. And uh, for this, basically, um, a small workstation can uh, fulfill our needs. But I imagine that when it passes on to companies like Google or IBM, then they will switch on all the supercomputing power to optimize the structure. Because when you start mass production, you really put billions on stake and you want the best of the best. And then what are, so would you say priority number one is designing the crystal? That's priority one? Yes, yes. Well, maybe first you should have an idea. You should, should realize, uh, you should formulate what you want to achieve. But once you formulated it uh, and you have a concept, uh, then uh, you come up with the design of the structure. And then priority two is helping to move that process along of the light matter coupling towards superconductivity and photonic quantum computing. All right, uh, so once you have structures, you need also to perform experiments that would be proof of concept experiments. It's, it's also a complex task. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you would not uh, have immediately a quantum computer, for example. You start with a single qubit and then two. Then you assemble together three, five, etc. Okay, I have a question. How does the light matter coupling become the first qubit? Um, uh, you see, uh, one of the designs we are working on is a so-called split ring resonator. It is like Mm, half moon, uh, uh, croissant, growing moon. Uh, so, crescent. How, how yeah, 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 that was right. Yeah, uh, so, here uh, what happens, uh, we have mm, uh, currents in this, uh, the superfluid currents in this crescent that go this way, that oscillate. Uh, so, if we say that current going clockwise is our state one, current going anti clockwise is our state zero, it's our basis and we achieve superpositions of these currents. So it's not going only clockwise or only anticlockwise, but it goes simultaneously in both directions. And this is a qubit. And then how does it take all of the states between the mixture of orange and apple juice? Uh, uh, then it depends how you prepare it. We, we uh, do it now with optical control. Uh, so with lasers, we set up the face of this uh, oscillating currents as, as we need and um, then then we also need to provide the readout that is much 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 trickier we do it with some interferometry techniques on, on a nano scale so this is this is challenging and not yet entirely done and this is the central goals of the lab uh, one of what's the uh, next no, I mean, I mentioned two, right? The superconductivity and quantum applications. I can, I can mention the third one. It is uh, physics of monoatomic um, chains of carbon. Uh, this is something where we are really world leaders in. Uh, monoatomic chains of carbon, is that graphene? No, graphene is a, is a two-dimensional crystal. In graphene, you have a plane a full, of, full of oh, atoms. Oh, mono uh, as a single? Yeah, yeah it's oh. a chain, one by one, one by oh, one. But why, why would you use just the chain instead of the 2D? Oh, it has many, many advantages. It is the, the thinnest wire you can imagine. Wire. The thinnest wire that we can imagine. Okay. For example, so, so, so uh, then uh, for uh, any kind of quantum applications, it is, it is a quantum wire where electrons pass one by one. So electric current is quantized. Uh, it is not like it, it does not change gradually, but it changes step by step like that. Uh, so this is a very interesting object, but it's very challenging because it's not easy to 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 make it to grow it. The, this is inflexible. 
uh, you mean uh, uh, so the wire you can potentially bend it yeah a, a single a t single mono monoatomic I can bend this mono yes, atomic? yes you can it is the most rigid wire uh, because the distance between uh, carbon atoms is just 1.2 angstrom so it's very very small they stick to each other very well uh, so it's very rigid but you can still bend it you fold can. it okay. okay and the uh, you have to the you have to are you using the same machine except with carbon a similar style of machine with no that's different uh, different this this grows with uh, with lasers uh, in a liquid in a colloid and first we we basically we decompose some target uh, crystal into fragments and then we extract this virus and then we stabilize them attaching gold nanoparticles at the ends uh, and then we deposit it because uh, to use it you need to put it on a substrate that's uh, some technology that that is uh, actually also a revolutionary technology we are now preparing several papers on that we uh, hope that we will be the first in the world to demonstrate this and apparently it's easier to make lasagna <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, vi virus is really challenging and uh, not much is known about that. Uh, this is purely experimental. Uh, in theory here is not of much help because you cannot foresee everything. Um, okay, and then, so these are the three. Yes. Okay, these are the three for the lab. Now, how do you take the 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 team right now is 10 you will be seeing it grow over time to around 30 35 how do you how do you and the 10 and the amount of limited amount of time that you have and all of the complexity that you have to achieve with doing the the simulation modeling first of the designs of the crystals and then to conduct the actual light matter coupling and then to see if you can go to the stages of superconductivity photonic quantum computing and then also doing this other task with the monoatomic carbon that's a lot of stuff for 10 people how do you figure out who's doing what in this process well, well first of all we collaborate with many labs across the world and with southampton by the way i keep very good ties and with uh, labs in Switzerland, in Italy, in, in, in Russia, and we have theorists coming from New York. So it's, it's, it's an international network, uh, basically, that, that, uh, uh, that tries to, to solve this problem, so we are not alone. These 10 people is just maybe nuclear, but there are many others who are involved. Okay, we can't forget about the children's books. So Alexei has authored 10 children's books now. And this is the newest, is that right? Yes. Our Cronus Chronicles. And the children's books inspire children into history, science. Yes, uh, yes. You know, I have four children. And uh, initially I was writing uh, for them, but then it turned out that it is of more or less general interest. Uh, this particular book, um, I was challenged uh, by a friend of mine to write a book on uh, Formula One races. That, challenged by a friend. Uh, yeah, that, 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 so he told me that it should be understandable, uh, so people should understand why it is so interesting and what is the science behind these races, because there is a lot of science involved here. And it uh, should also promote his company that is called Acronius. Uh, so that's why uh, the main character of this book is a, an 11 year old girl uh, who is called Acronis and her brother is a famous uh, pilot of F1 and there is some mafia involved so there is there is a lot of adventures in this story and it is um, I hope it is it was very funny and easy to read but also it contains a glossary where terms like pit stop pit lane uh, whatever are um, uh, explained and there are drawings that illustrate everything and uh, you, you, you learn from this book what kind of tires, for example, these cars need and how often you need to change them during the race, things like that. Uh, so that was the first, one, uh, first challenge and then he changed me for the second book that is closer to what I was talking about today, that's Acronis and Quantum Computer and that one will be published hopefully before the end of this year. 
Wow, Cronus Quantum Computing. Wow. And I, I love your, your true multidisciplinary man to be able to take and make uh, such complex subjects, uh, starting with you know Formula One and then getting all the way up to quantum computing. This will be very interesting to see how you synthesize and disseminate at the level of the child. That will be very interesting. Alexei, what is the meaning of life, of this big human experiment? Uh, you know, uh, I had a professor when I was a student in Russia, and uh, he was from Armenia, like you. Uh, so he, as any uh, Armenian professor, uh, he was very good in making speeches at the table when we had parties. So I remember his, uh, his toast um, about the sense of life. Uh, he told us, uh, students in physics, that, you know, uh, everyone wants to be happy in this world, but it's not interesting for, for a scientist. For a scientist, the sense of life is success. Uh, so, if you have chosen this, this uh, field of, of, of activity, you, you, you are supposed to be successful. This is, this is your goal, be successful in your research. So, I think it is very true in my case and for my colleagues. Uh, really, sometimes we forget our families, we forget to eat, we forget to sleep because we want the result. And the success in, in science is very important for us. And that also speaks to the importance of identifying what your gift or what your unique gem is that you can bring the world and just go after that with an insane amount of appetite and hunger and go. Do you think this is a simulation? No, I think it's reality. Why? Uh, no, science, you know, science is, is a real game. It is, it is, it is a game, uh, but uh, it is about real things. It's all like, like our life. It's also a sort of games, but, but it, it is real. And it makes it, it, it interesting. And last question, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I think nature is more beautiful than anything artificial, uh, so probably nature. And then everyone chooses, uh, well, I like mountains, for example, very much. Alexei, thank you so much for coming on to our show and teaching us. This has been... Thanks a lot. It so was a pleasure. So interesting. Thank you. Thanks for all your great work. Best of luck with the lab. Best Thank you luck. very much. Best of luck. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about light matter coupling, about cutting edge physics, about quantum computation, superconductivity, about all the things that we talked about regarding the second quantum revolution and about how we can best maximize prosperity moving forward. Check out the links in the bio below. Again, we have the Westlake profile page for Alexei as well as the Wikipedia link and also the book link. Check out the book, share them with your families, friends, and peoples online. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the people in your communities that you believe in. Support them, help them grow, support simulation we, so, we can do so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to Westlake and interviewing great people like Alexei. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace. That's a wrap, yeah. Alexei. Thank you so much. Okay, I know you good. gotta run. Um, may we? That's for you. Keep it. Oh, for you're so so kind. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you. I love this. I'm so excited. You're. I can't believe you're doing one on quantum computing.